Well, thank you. It's been a fantastic day so far to sample the ongoing riches and also to hear of the early, the really early history of the CHE. Um, it's some comfort to realize that there are lively folk older than I am who are still jumping around doing things and Ulrich has illustrated that beautifully. I haven't quite reached his age yet, but um, I'm still living history as I very much appreciate as I'm still, I'm honorary fellow at, I'm honorary fellow, do you want it really loud like this? No, no, right. We can do that way if you prefer. But <laughs> um, will you warn me when I've got five minutes left? Whoever's chairing, please. Because then I won't need to worry about this, or at least I'll keep an eye on it. Right. Um, I want to make it clear at the outset of my contribution today that I am not an ecologist and that my encounter with the Centre for Human Ecology was intense, but in a way, in essence, fleeting. This were time, this encounter, was at a time of organizational, and indeed it happens for me, personal crisis. My personal connection with the Center for Human Ecology began at the conference at Nature Religion Today, held at Charlotte Mason College, then briefly owned by Lancaster University in a very ambitious moment by Lancaster. They had to sell it soon because they got into financial difficulties, uh, in Keswick in April 1996. An Alistair Mackintosh, a figure I, they'd never heard of, had registered, a figure then unknown, as I say, to any of us at Lancaster University, and in due course, he commenced the delivery of an academic paper on the Harris Super Quarry Inquiry. Suddenly, without warning and in mid-paper, he cast aside his text, which I won't do, donned a bardic cloak and began to declaim the Gal Gale epic. The effect was electric, and I recall one participant, it was my first personal encounter with the pagan community at that stage, rushing out of the lecture theater, tearing off his shirt and shrieking, anxious perhaps to direct, reconnect directly with nature and the goddess, doubtless um, cloud, uh, uh, sky clad. It was electrifying, the event, uh, this that thing. Of course, having heard Alistair speak a number of times, I wait thinking, when's the moment going to come in a talk? There will be a moment when uh, people are made to sort of shiver with um, ecstasy or deep fear. I don't know which. <laughs> Alistair and I hit it off as we shared, not least, extremely challenging experiences of organizational crisis in our respective British universities as these were forcibly managerialized and undergoing a market-orientated normalization. For a time, I was directly involved in the controversial and painful transition of the CHE from its location in the within the University of Edinburgh into an independent status through the Open University Validation Service. I convened the committee for this. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because it was a question of taking an organization and trying to shoehorn it into a framework for which it was specifically not de de uh, designed. At that stage, the Open University, that the um, Quality Assurance Agency in British HE was immensely powerful and was seeking to apply the uh, quality standard ISO 9000 to the production of students. So that students each course it offered subject area, had definite prescriptions as to what the psychobehavioral and attainment attributes would be of a student. And quality was measuring the congruity, the congruence between the profile of the student who is produced and the pre-given criteria. And this, of course, was directly opposite what the CHE was intended with the MSC, where people were being equipped for tasks which were not predefined. They had to be competent but open critically. And this was, doing that operation was very, very difficult, I found at the time. And so, uh, uh, and for the, this was a seriously unwelcome aggregation because it involved prolonged immersion in precisely those projects, processes of normalization, 
within the managerialist framework that had led to my departure from the University of St. Andrews, where I happened to hold the Chair of Divinity. I um, analyzed the managerialization of the university in the annual postgraduate lecture in 1992, had a run-in with the principal's enforcer at that time at a dinner, and my colleagues, without my knowledge, uh, told me I had to resign after their meeting. And they were ordered to by the principal. This was a life-changing event for me. I lost my identity, which was an identity grounded in acute conflict in my childhood, which goes right back to the experience of the First World War and other, the Second World War and other things. Because, as I said in my little note here, my father was Czech. He, um, he arrived in early 1941 uh, after internment in the Ukraine and the Soviet Union, uh, an experience about which he was unable to speak, basically. And uh, my parents, I was brought up apart from them. So for me, from early childhood, striving for an identity, a personal identity, was there from a very, very early stage. And that identity was shattered in St. Andrews, and that started me on a path of exploration to find to build an identity, because my identity had formed by an evangelical Christian conversion experience when I was 20, and that was destroyed in St. Andrews. I lost my identity, and I had to face an abyss inwardly and start to find a way of living. However, I have lived through my academic career in what my great teacher, Donald Mackenzie McKinnon of Oban, uh, and the University of Aberdeen and Cambridge and then back to Aberdeen called the borderlands of theology for my entire life. Some years after my brief but direct engagement with the CHE, I was asked to write the brief article to which um, reference has already been made in Bron Taylor's, uh, an article on the Center for Human Ecology for Bron Taylor's magnificent Encyclopedia of Religion and Nature published in 2005. And I concluded this entry with the following words. The role of the CHE as a pioneering organization is indisputable. Many of its original analytical insights and practices have become part of the widely distributed armory of the informed environmental movement. Indeed, this very success now poses intensified questions as to the future of human ecology with which, I optimistically said, the CHE is now fully engaged. And that process is continuing today of looking at what future options are, it seems to me. In 2005, um, it, it, is, it is for others to debate the question of originality, because we've seen there's all sorts of factors have gone into the brew, as it were, into the cauldron of the CHE. But at all events, the CHE was undoubtedly a significant entrepot for ideas drawn from many sources that were harnessed to the goal of activism and of creating and developing informed, effective activists. In 2005, I summarized the then academic remit as follows. The core elements in the CHE MSc program in human ecology comprise scientific ecology, the social and psychological aspects of ecological thinking, and the motivation of human ecological activism with particular emphasis upon the role of communities in relation to place and environment, including the spiritual underpinning of human community. And Alistair has again drawn our attention to that this morning. Again, it's for me to comment in some way upon where the CHE now stands with regard to this remit. My concern now is to raise what I consider to be fundamental questions pertaining to the context and the content of, of, the, of a contemporary and future agenda for human ecology. So that's my introduction. First part here, the section, from crisis to catastrophe, the paradoxical return of eschatology. So I'm going to put my professor of theology hat on here, and the next section is going to be about the resurgence of eschatology, the last things, ta eschata, the last things, and the paradox is that there are now in organizations and in the wider field about this sense of an end and the fear that arises with that and how that can be coped with. That's my next stage here. 
When I encountered the CHE for the first time, and this is really repeating and alluding in summary back to what Ulrich was saying, uh, what, for the first time in the last years of the 20th century, the explication of the global environmental problematique was a central concern and the goal sustainability. Of course, as we've had pointed out in detail this morning, a shift has taken place in the course of a half century marked by growing crisis. The global problematic now amounts to an unprecedented potential catastrophe. Indeed, according to some, the likelihood of total societal collapse. Now, I'm venturing now onto ground that is undoubtedly controversial, but what I'm going to say actually opens up the extremities it seems to me, within which we need to find some form of active middle ground. We are in an era of crisis, a noun derived from the Greek word krinine, to judge, and this etymological nexus takes us back to the New Testament in the Western tradition, to the delay of the parousia, the delay of the return of Christ. The question as to the proximity, the closeness of the kingdom, the kingdom of God to be associated with the return of Christ, gave rise to a whole area later on in theology of eschatology, the study and articulation of the doctrine of the last things, most fully expressed in the revelation of, Saint, of John, the last book in the Christian Bible. At, however, times of profound societal crisis, this eschatological residuum is re-excited, and it is within this setting that I now allude to a controversial figure who crystallizes that intensification between context and consciousness. My first venture in this area was when I wrote a book on um, Ernst Bloch, the Jewish, German Jewish messianic thinker, who tried to perform a transcendental deduction of the future in his theology as a post-Kantian thinker. We won't go there now, but I went deep into that and applied his insights to what happened in the, after the First World War in Germany and so-called Weimar culture, where there was a gulf that had to be filled. And it was men, mainly men, who tried to fill that gulf, to make assertions of being. And recently, most recently, in a lecture in the Holy Rood in Stirling, I addressed the situation of the Church of Scotland, of which I am still a member of the Church of the Holy Rood in Stirling, um, as to how it responds and is responding. And I'll come to that again in a moment. You may think it's strange, this weirdo's talking about the Church of Scotland. We have nothing to do with the Church of Scotland here. But the Church of Scotland has a fundamental role in the evolution of Scottish identity from the time of early modernity. We have to take it seriously. So then the understanding and depiction of the social construction of individual and social identity is a zone of controversy and the stakes, I, in my view, are very high indeed. Thus, for example, Professor Jem Bendel has emerged as a leading figure in crystallizing what is now referred to as collapsology, the inevitability of societal collapse and his program in his global manifesto, which has been downloaded, one reads it over a million times, Deep Adaptation, a Map for Navigating Climate Tragedy. Bendel argued in that manifesto, which I think was 2019 when it first came out, he argued that a new agenda, community and movement for deep adaptation to our predicament has been born. It is comprised of people who believe that a climate-influenced collapse of societies in most parts of the world in the coming decades is either likely, inevitable, or already unfolding. They are organizing a diversity of activities to help reduce harm, save what we can, and create possibilities for the future while experiencing meaning and joy in the process. He summarizes his purpose, which is to offer his purpose to offer a new meta-framing of the implications for research, organizational practice, personal development, and public policy called the Deep Adaptation Agenda. Its key aspects of resilience, relinquishment, restoration, and reconciliation are explained. This agenda does not seek to build on existing scholarship on climate adaptation, as it is premised on the view that societal collapse is now likely inevitable or already unfolding. So this is 
looking at the world in the sense of the inevitability of catastrophe rather than the avoidance of catastrophe. It is, he says, res a responsible act to commute this analysis now and invite people to support each other, myself included, in exploring the implications, including the psychological and spiritual implications. So we're not here the only people looking at the spiritual implications of the situation. I first addressed this transition from what I would call crisis to catastrophe in a recent lecture at a small event held uh, on, the, on the futures of the Church of Scotland delivered in the ancient church of the Holy Ridden Stirling, where I happen to be a member. In the lecture, I proposed an exploration of a juxtaposition of the top-down managerialization of the Church of Scotland outlined in the now notorious strategic plan with the advanced crisis that invites eschatological interpretation when represented in an extreme form as Bendel's demand for adaptation. Now what I'm doing is I'm juxtaposing um, a intense managerial problem, a ruthless managerialization of the Church of Scotland involving the amputation of anything that costs too much. And this elderly people in great distress because their eight or nine hundred year old church sites being shut down, bang, like that. This is it's a superb, ruthless, unmitigated example of top-downery, this approach. Quite remarkable. You may well wonder at this point, what on earth has this to do with the CHE, an organization of free spirits and long divorce from the reformed Christian tradition, generally speaking? Pragmatically, my illusion is relevant because the Church of Scotland has both influenced Scotland, in my view, in powerful terms, sometimes negatively, sometimes positively, and at a time of retreat and retrenchment, it is an organization that still owns lots of spare sacred spaces, which are around. At a different level, the radical modernization or managerialization of the Church of Scotland is an accessible example of extreme latter-day imposed managerialization. It's graspable as, as, a, as an entity, a transformation undertaken with apparently little regard for ancestral traditions of place, what the French historian Pierre Nora has called lieu de mémoire, places of memory. And defining that, a lieu de mémoire is any significant entity, whether material or non-material in nature, which by dint of human will or the work of time has become a symbolic element of the memorial heritage of any community. This is from the official translation of Les Lieux de Mémoire, Realms of Memory, Rethinking the French Past, uh, 1998, University of Chicago Press. Now, there's a double irony at work here, which may allow us insight into the dialectics of disintegration, which you now face. Let us pause for a moment and consider this juxtaposition, a micro example of a macro situation. On the one hand, an ancestral church representing tradition with a long-standing relationship with core aspects of Scottish cultural identity belatedly adopts radical managerialization as the drastic solution to its decline and demographic crisis. This amounts, in my view, to an extreme form of what Max Weber described as the routinization of charisma. And those of you who've done sociology will know what I'm talking about, but essentially it's the process that Max Weber, who was polymath, mapped the changes that took place when the activities, well, I, 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 I'll go on with my text and explain it here. The Church of England's newly intensified form of self-regulation has affinities with a much disputed transition in the early church from a small Galilean Jewish group believing in the imminent return of their leader to a hierarchical organization. This was a transformation resonantly characterized by the Catholic modernist historian Alfred Loisy, 1857 to 1940, as Jesus preached the kingdom of God and what came forth was the church. Jésus annonçait le royaume et c'est l'église qui est venue. Community, this, uh, so this a strategy that repeats, in my view, the deferral and then the repression of eschatological hope in the early church. There's an affinity. And indeed, I could go more widely, it's an area I've done some work on, on the successive 
crises with which spiritual developments are related in history when you talk about deep crisis, particularly um, after the First World War, but also after the Napoleonic Wars as well, very interestingly. On the other hand, to this forced, rigid managerialization of the Church of Scotland, it is Bendel, who is an expert, a professor of management and leadership studies, who has contentiously gained, engaged with ecology. And he takes up language close to the discourse of the end time, the last things. This is very paradoxical. Somebody at the core of managerial control has flipped inwardly. He's changed his views radically. I think he's had some kind of an intense conversion experience, which in what I've read he's not talked about, of a deep ecology kind. When we contemplate, he says, this possibility of societal collapse, it can seem abstract. But when I say, and one can almost hear the voice of the preacher here, but when I say starvation, destruction, migration, disease, and war, I mean in your own life. With the power down, soon, soon, soon you wouldn't have water coming out of your tap. Things have moved on. We're getting warning about that now. You will depend on your neighbors for food and some warmth. You will become malnourished. You won't know where to stay or go. You will fear being violently killed before starving to death. In this setting, radical contrast here, whereas our church, if one could put it that way, the Church of Scotland, one part of the church, has embraced a rational and unsparing managerialism, an archpriest of management in its higher form in leadership studies, that's a very interesting distinction between managerialism, management and leadership, which is a fascinating, so we won't go there now, but it's very important. It's, a, it's where people try to learn to be charismatic. And I see this in management. People who put themselves through hell to become charismatic. Um, you know, it's forced to be trained. I will be a charismatic. Difficult. <laughs> Not content with, what's, with what some have referred to as his climate porn. Uh, it, Bendel's been accused of trading in climate porn, um, Bendel's recently promulgated Scholar's Oath to the Future amounts to a kind of public confession and shaming of collusion and guilt on the part of intellectuals and university teachers. As it happens, I have not signed this document, although one of my best and certainly my most learned friend has. So now to come back to the CHE, and I am jumping around a bit, but I'm trying to open up space, really, for pushing what on earth this is about, where the CHE might go, the places it might go. New. Clearly, we've seen today, people are going in all sorts of directions. And at this moment, I would like to launch into a lecture on transcendental presuppositions of what one would do, what, what, one, what, what are the categories that we need to underpin our view of reality as a whole which goes back to my preoccupation with Kant and Hegel and all the rest of it back into the late 18th and early 19th century. But we won't go there now. But for me, human ecology has to have that status. But how can it be articul articulated in a way which does honor to the science but is real with regard to what Alistair was talking about, the epistemology and I would say the ontology of, of that, how that operates. Since the foundation of the Center for Human Ecology in 1972, the components of human ecology have moved, the components have moved from peripheral status to the core of human concerns. That has been eminently obvious in today's offerings and displays. The original, and I'm going to use this word advisedly, prophetic message of the CHE, its pioneering assertion that a multidimensional response to environment de environmental degradation and climate change linked to practical activism was essential, has become an established factor in governance and public contestation. For many, if not a majority, this message, the human ecology message, maybe not with that name, is no longer marginal, but an, almost an orthodoxy, albeit a contested one in the political domain. Paradoxically, while individuals associated with the Center for Human Ecology may well have attained status and positions close to the center of social power, and I was, was remarkable this morning hearing the, remark, the extraordinary way that Ulrich, as it were, was close in the University of Edinburgh to centers of power and a real mover and shaker with regard to global figures, 
The organization itself, it seems to me, has not at the moment migrated from the margins to the center of social power. And Veren's talk today was about how you subsist and survive in an environment where you're not close to the centers of power and you're trying to moderate, to modify, transform how power or is managed and operates in organizations. Given that the original, uh, yes, given then that the original concerns of the CHE as regards ecology and the environmental crisis are now mainline, then just what could or should be the major preoccupations and commitments of human ecology in the CHE? Um, Alistair McIntosh has given us an answer this morning, be more radical, go deeper. However, should we mourn the continuing marginality of the CHE as a body, or conversely see this as a creative opportunity within the complex dialectical tensions of managerial and mediatic modernity, in which the human appears to be undergoing dissolution as rapidly and dramatically as the polar ice sheets. And that would be a point of which I would like to go in, but I won't, can't go into the whole question of the post-arguments about the post-human. So, whilst we might look around this room and seek out charismatic figures and perhaps hope for a second coming of such figures, I consider that our concern would be better directed at what the charism, as opposed to the um, charismatic uh, charisma, the charism, the actual gift, what the gift and message of the CHE should now be. We recall, go back for a moment, the core elements of the CHE MSc program in human ecology, comprise scientific ecology, the social and psychological aspects of ecological thinking, and the motivation of human ecological activism, with particular emphasis upon the role of communities in relation to place and environment, including the spiritual underpinning of human community. This might well comprise the investigation and facilitation of the skills and wisdom required to facilitate transition, but we have to bear the deep adaptation agenda in mind because preserving hope in the face of catastrophe is important and that's come through today. I want to conclude by considering what I call marginality and the hollow bone. For me, the image of the hollow bone as a key image in core shamanism across the world is that of becoming something through which power, enlightenment, blessing, grace, whatever you're going to call it, love is going to flow. If we pause for a moment with what Max Horkheim, Horkheimer and T.W. Adorno plaintively called the dialectical of, it, of enlightenment, written at the height of the Second World War in 1941, it becomes apparent that an implicit societal resolution or collusion has been broken. This, this is a deep statement he, they made. And this is about the relationship with nature, uh, written by two, particularly um, Adorno, Thomas Wiesengrund Adorno, who's very much a Jewish thinker in this regard. He argued, they argued, the enslavement to nature of people today cannot be separated from social progress. The increase in economic productivity, which creates the conditions for a more just world, also affords the technical apparatus and the social groups controlling it a disproportionate advantage over the rest of the population. The individual, they said, is entirely nullified in the face of, economic, of the economic powers. These powers are taking society's domination over nature to unimagined heights, while individuals as such are vanishing before the apparatus they serve, which I think happens in managerialism in its extreme form. They are provided for by that apparatus and better than ever before. However, this bargain in which the individual vanishes but is provided for has now been broken. There is no longer going to be the provision. That's a profound crisis. It is succeeded, the dialectic of enlightenment, where in which the tension between nature and rationality was one of the key tensions addressed. We're now into a dialectic of disintegration the possibility of what Jem Bendels regards as total societal collapse. 
Whilst Bendel may venture beyond the scientific consensus, as some argue, as regards climate change, his point stands. What can the vast mass of humanity who do not live in relatively underpopulated countries like Scotland, what can they do? There are words that appear to define any given era. I'm concluding now. I would suggest that in our own era, an apparent end time, in inverted commas, Anglo-American public discourse is infused by such terms as vulnerability, trauma, and, by contrast, empowerment. The present right-wing regime in London is attempting a shock treatment, a galvanic re-excitation of the will to live, a form of empowerment achieving, achievable, apparently, by purging vulnerability and endorsing strength through pain. Now, that's a very crude summary of what's going on, but I think that's what's happening. As the topoi, the loki, the apparent contemplators, I'm very interested in with rhetoric. I did a book with a social psychologist quite a number of years ago now on the rhetoric of the human sciences, on how disciplines are constructed. And to me, there's a crisis in the human ecology as to what its fundamental commonplaces are, not its, not its fragments, but those things which can unify and empower the discourse in the public domain, which is a rhetorical problem, a problem looking at it in positive, not reductive terms, um, uh, 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 rhetoric. But that's, again, a whole discussion, another discussion about the re revival of rhetoric associated by two, with two Belgian scholars particularly, but we'll come back to the point here. As the topoi, the low-key, the apparent commonplaces of public discourse alert us to the reality that, in my view, the task of e human ecology is now an anthropological one. This, for me, following such thinkers as Roy Rappaport, implies the anthropologist, implies engagement with processes that might well involve shamanic techniques, ritual, and non-dualism. Besides critical engagement with tradition, a boringly archaic concern which I continue to own. When I left, when I left St Andrews, I undertook to myself that I would never do teach theology again until I could do it in love and with truth, with truth and in love. And I now feel I've reached that stage in life through various things that I experience a flow of love through myself now, which um, is, despite my age, is a great blessing. I feel incredibly alive, um, which... Well, go, won't go there. Right, anyway. As intimated in my abstract, the task now is nothing less than venturing a 21st century project analogous to what um, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing characterized in 1780 as the education of the human race, the Erzion des Menschengeschlechts, as what, at, at a time which was also regarded as a time of deep crisis, at that stage, it was the onset of industrialization across Europe. We're now facing deindustrialization with huge pop pop populations created for industrialization, which for many no longer exists. So there is, after the First World War, there were women who were described as the surplus women. We're now facing the question of surplus humanity. How do we deal with it? Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for some um, hugely provocative trains of thought there that we might want to pursue in the future. Um, I'm afraid time is not on our side, um, and we're running a bit late. If there's one or two really brief questions, any burning questions, I've got lots of questions, but if there's one or two that folk may have that we can briefly put to Richard. Uh, yeah. Thanks, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I just was thinking, because I, I often think about arts um, being there to help um, sensitize us for the shape of things to come. Um, and I was just thinking, because there were so many connections in what you were saying, and I was just thinking about like whether systems collapse could ever be seen as sort of valuable to arts and culture. And when I mean, what I mean by valuable, I mean generative, really. And I wonder if that's a good question to be asking or starting from that position as we move forward. Just wondered. You've, you've hit on a point, actually. When my, in my lecture in Stirling, 
I used, I, I basically was warned by my anthropologist friend and former colleague, Jeffrey Samuel, who's a very well-known Tibetologist, now a resident in Australia, who say, you've got to be careful with this Bendel stuff. Um, issue trigger warnings. He's been profoundly affected. But what I did was to basically take not to look, and I've studied these people, uh, you know, of, of Karl Barth, uh, book, the book on Karl Barth, uh, these other people after the First World War in Weimar Germany. It's what, Germany, it's one of my studies. I went to the poets and to the poet response to the catastrophe of the First World War and developed a typology with McDermid, who is just a fantastic poet and uh, whom I um, constantly re-engage with Hugh McDermid's work and did a, a, a lecture last a couple of years ago for another centre like this but the, um, on geopoetics on McDermid. McDermid um, the English Welsh poet, um, oh, um, sorry? No, no, it wasn't R.S. Thomas, sorry. It was um, uh, the man who wrote on the goddess, the white goddess. Um, sorry? Robert Graves, thank you. Yes, Robert Graves. I'm, I'm, I can remember lectures from 40 years ago, but names is a bit difficult these days. Um, Robert Graves and C.S. Lewis, and looked at how they handled the inner un and the societal annihilation, the emptiness, rather than go to abstract philosophy, to go to the poets. So yes, I think the role of poets in approaching, expressing this is a wonderful bridge between the danger of catastrophe and the fabric of people's life, not on, just on the level of rationality, but on emotions, upon their embodied selves. Yeah. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you once again to Professor Roberts. <laughs>